So what is a mixer? I assume most people are familiar, but I'll go fairly quickly. A uh, mixer is a circuit that ideally creates either the sum or the difference frequency between two incoming signals. Uh, Terminology-wise, we generally call the incoming small signal the RF signal. The output signal is usually what we call the IF signal. And then the large signal uh, we call the LO. The LO is one of the most important features of a mixer to create high linearity. And I'll describe in gory detail uh, what that means. But if we create lower frequency signals, we call it down conversion. If we create higher frequency signals, we call that up conversion. How does this actually happen? Well, there's basically two ways that this is done. And um, the first way is something that's very often described in textbooks. And frankly, I don't like it for a couple reasons. But the primary reason is that this is, is not actually how commercial mixers operate. Um, if you are in the business of making mixers for customers, you never actually make a nonlinear mixer. But I'll, I'll describe to you what, what's going on. Um, if you have two incoming signals into a nonlinear transfer function, so some kind of nonlinear circuit, you can get a whole blend of intermodulation in that nonlinear element. And if you do the, the Taylor expansion, you can see that there's a second order term that expands. And if you do the trigonometric identities, blah, 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 you end up getting a sum and a difference term. Now, this is basically something that's taught to every undergrad. And unfortunately, this isn't actually how we do it. And it's not the proper way, in my opinion, of thinking about how mixers actually work. Um, people often call these square law mixers. And one of the critical problems with square law mixers is that they're going to be narrow band, and they're going to be finicky in terms of the impedances that you show around them. So if you're making broadband mixers, we pretty much ignore this entirely. The more important type of mixer is what we call a switching mixer. And what a switching mixer is, is that we take a very strong, fastly switching local oscillator, and then we actuate some kind of device, and we inject a small signal into that device. The fast switching LO chops that incoming small signal to create some kind of output waveform, as we show in the, in the picture. That IF waveform, if you take the, the, Fourier series, or the Fourier transform of that, turns out to have a very interesting spectrum. And the spectrum is actually listed um, by that VIF equation. When you inspect that equation, um, you can see that the 50% duty cycle square wave chopping creates only one RF by odd LO tones. So you only end up with one by one, one by three, one by five, and so on. One by one is what we're looking for. And it turns out that this switching mixer is very efficient. Um, theoretically, it's about 3.9 dB of conversion efficiency. Um, it also generates pretty strong 3 by 1s and 5 by 1s. But as it turns out, in my experience, most of the time, those don't come into play as a problem. So why is a switching mixer important? Well, from my point of view, it's really twofold. First, it's highly linear. You can see that, um, in theory, if I switch this device infinitely fast, I do not generate intermodulation distortion. I just generate odd LOs by one RFs. So that means if I inject two small signal, L, two small signal RFs, I cannot intermodulate that switch to create multi-tone distortion. And this is what happens in, in many types of mixers, including our T3 mixer. Um, and then the other, the other feature of this is that this is very broadband. The, the, the limit of the broadband nature of this type of mixer is only dependent on the surrounding circuitry and the speed of the device. And if you're using really fast diodes that switch, uh, th that can operate to terahertz, you can switch that device very fast. So what are the um, basic specs of a mixer and how do we, um, why do we care about them? Well, primarily it's because mixers limit dynamic range of systems. The first way that they limit it is through conversion efficiency loss. In, in this talk, I'm only going to be talking about passive mixers. Um, I'm not talking about active, so we always have loss. All mixers have some amount of gain, compr or, well, gain compression, loss compression, however you want to look at it. But there's a, there's a max limit on how much input power you can provide. All mixers have some associated noise figure. Typically, the actual switching noise figure is equivalent to the loss. However, 
a very important and nefarious form of noise comes into play at higher frequencies because of LO noise contribution. And LO noise contribution tends to be much more important in our experience than the actual switching noise figure. Um, the higher in frequency you go with the LO, the, the more noisy your local oscillator is going to be, and that's going to translate directly onto the IF. And so you have to be very careful sometimes, especially when you're dealing with uh, low-level signaling. Port-to-port -port isolation matters. No mixer is perfect. Ideally, all three ports do not talk to each other, but there's, there's always some form of leakage. In an up conversion, you may not be able to filter the LO, um, and uh, it can be very difficult over broad bands. Single tone intermodulation is the classic M by N product. Um, there's always some distribution of, of power that goes into all harmonics. And ideally, mixers don't generate this. But the more broadband the conversion, the more likely you will have crossing spurs. And there are some very nasty crossing spurs that occur, especially like if you're doing an octave band up conversion, you have a two by one cross usually. That spur tends to be one of the strongest spurs you can generate in a balanced mixer. And then probably the more uh, general idea of, of multi-tone intermod. And this, this shows up as a lot of ways. Uh, sometimes we just call it a two-tone intermod. But it also is represented by spectral regrowth and, and many other forms. But the basic idea is that you have third order and even higher order terms intermixing with each other, creating a bunch of nasty, unfilterable tones. So in the end, every one of these specs actually can affect your dynamic range. And I have seen examples from customers where one of these specs limited them, or a multitude of those specs. And so we work very hard to get all of them good at the same time, which is sort of like a game of whack-a-mole. You can get a few of them right, then you might lose others. And so um, that's, I think, where the, the real art form comes in, is, is how do you deal with that. So switching mixers are the mixers that are most used in the, in the field. And they are split up into various, uh, various forms. There's really active and there's passive. The active types are the ones that are generally, generally made using Gilbert cells. And those are um, either FET-based or BJT-based. Uh, they're almost always integrated onto silicon. And they can work very well. Um, they can be made by the truckloads. And they can be very cheap. We actually don't have any expertise in this area besides a sort of anecdotal interest in it. I won't be talking about that today at all. Um, the passive mixer area is really um, split up into diode-based passives and FET-based passives. We also don't make passive FET mixers at this time. Um, there's some interesting work going on right now that maybe in the future it'll be something we gravitate towards. But uh, right now, our particular expertise is in diodes, and that's what I'll focus on today. So diode mixers fall in line with or the most common double balanced mixers are double balanced and triple balanced. And I'll show some schematics of what the difference is, but they're all basically the same concept. And um, the primary difference is that the triple balanced mixer allows for massive band overlap with a balanced IF. The double balanced usually does not. Um, and I should state, I may be making some generalizations. Um, don't hammer me on it because I'm. When I say that something happens the way it happens, I'm saying 90% of the time it's like this. But I promise you my dad's seen the, the, the caveat to that statement. Um, but this is a general rule of thumb that I'm trying to describe. So um, today, we'll talk about three types of diode mixer technologies. The first is the classic hybrid mixer. Well, I'll describe what the limitations are of it and um, what the cooler uh, performance that we can get out of them um, can be with the T3 mixer. And then I'll talk about the new kids on the block for us, which are the Mimics and the Microlithics. And those are really the technologies that are very well suited to higher, to higher frequencies. All three of these technologies, by the way, are basically switching. And so the question is, if we're talking about a linearity, from a linearity point of view, what, what limits the achievable linearity? And how do we optimize this? So this is a classic diode mixer. Um, you can see that there's a diode package. There's a diode IC that's been packaged into another package, and that gets packaged into a bigger package. So we have the diode, 
the diode package with leads sticking out that get soldered in, and then we have a circuit board. This is all handmade, by the way. Um, we have a multitude of different tuning elements and balance structures, and this is the art form um, that I think my, my dad was one of the key pioneers in from the 70s to today. And you can achieve incredibly broadband performance, and you can do a lot of very interesting things with the circuits. Um, primarily because of the effectively unlimited three-dimensionality three of this, you can make some very exotic structures that you could never do in a planar structure. And my dad, for his entire career, has utilized that capability to do things that, for example, a mimic, mimic, mimic designer could never have. The double balance topologies are A, B, and C, and um, they all consist of essentially a diode ring quad. And then the triple balanced consists of uh, two diode ring quads operated in a push-pull manner. This is the most common structure that we uh, tend to think about with triple balanced. And what you can see is that the IF actually has its own balance structure because the IF current is differential at the diodes. So we extract it with a uh, IF ballon. The IF ballon governs the, the uh, bandwidth of the IF port and can be overlapping with the LO and the RF. So we have mixers that might go 2 to 26 gigahertz on the LO and the RF, and the IF can go 1 to 10. So the, virtually the entire band can be overlapped. We also have, um, and, and one caveat to that is therefore, the IF, LO, and RF are just labels. There's absolutely no reason why I can't actually convert from the L to the R using it using the IF port as the, the large signal port. And so when you're dealing with passive mixers like we are, the, it's a reciprocal product. So input and output has a very blurred line. And uh, we use that to great effect actually in the T3 mixers, and I'll show you why later. So hybrid mixers are great. They're complex. They have a lot of diode options, and uh, they're easy to modify. The balance govern the bandwidth of operation, and here's the big thing. The linearity is dictated primarily by the diode forward voltage. So what physically is happening in, in a realistic mixer? Um, ideally, the diode would switch instantaneously from on to off state. It would either have infinite resistance or zero resistance. This doesn't actually happen. The diode always goes through some transition period uh, on the IV curve. And you can see that with the ideal commutator, by the way, if you're confused by the terminology, switch and commutator are used interchangeably. So if I say ideal commutator, it's like saying an ideal switch. Um, I don't actually know the origin of why people don't call it the same thing every time, but just so you're not confused. The ideal commutator, if it's operated in this single-ended mixer example, does not generate anything except for the one by one and odd by one spurs. The realistic diode necessarily goes through the IV transition period and the, and the small signal RF can always intermodulate. That's the source of IMD in these types of mixers. So you'd say to yourself, well, maybe I should try to switch through this period as quickly as possible and that would be a very wise thing to do. If you do that, you can greatly improve the IMD of a mixer. The faster I get through that transition period, the lower the intermod, and the larger the voltage swing, the lower the intermod, in theory. And there was a guy who wrote a paper um, from, I believe it was when Keysight was Agilent was actually HP, and HP, uh, this guy, HP Walker, that's kind of ironic, I didn't think of that. His name is HP and he's from HP. Um, he wrote this paper, Sources of Intermodulation in Diode Ring Mixers, and he came up with a back-of-the-envelope calculation for an approximate IMD equation as a function of the slope of the switching function. And he found that as you increase the LO voltage or you decrease the rise time, you can directly improve the IP3. And there was no boundary condition to how good the IP3 got. If you could make the rise time zero, in theory, the IP3 became infinite. And obviously there's difficulties with that first order approximation. But it turns out, and we can show later, that this is a reasonably good approximation most of the time. Uh, actually, I should say that, let me rephrase that. It's a good approximation 
in T3 mixers. It's not a good approximation in all of our other mixers. So how good is this, um, or how important is this idea of a square wave transition through the LO switching period? Well, it's, it's actually really powerful. Just with a few odd harmonics of the LO getting into the switch, I can improve the IP3 easily 10 dB. In fact, um, but you also see that it kind of obeys this almost like, well, it obeys this logarithmic kind of curve. So there's diminishing returns. If I get the 11th, the 11th harmonic in, getting the 31st harmonic in is not that useful to me. And, and then you, have, you should talk about what the actual practicality of that waveform is going to be if you're dealing with a 10 gigahertz LO drive. So what is the practicality of getting higher order odd terms into a mixer? Well, not necessarily great if you're making banded mixers. In the case, there, there are two primary forms of balance that we use in, in diode mixers. The first is what we call capacitively coupled. Capacitively coupled balance are based on quarter waves. Um, march on balance are fall in this category, very popular type. Uh, broadside coupled tapers, all these different types of tricks that we play. And all of these have some finite bandwidth, typically on the order of a few octaves. So it's pretty easy to make a mixer that goes 4 to 20 gigahertz. Very difficult to make it go 1 to 100. And if you want to apply a square wave LO and you're dealing with balance inside the mixer, you have to be very aware that you might not be getting the odd harmonics to the diodes. And this is one of the fundamental problems of creating commutating switching mixers. There is another type of balance, though, that we use to great effect in our T3 mixer, which is what we call the transmission line transformer balun. This is a balun that has magnetic assist on the, the, the uh, balance pair, and we can achieve multi-decade performance with this. We have, in some of our mixers, balance based on this topology that can go about a megahertz to beyond 20 gigahertz in a single small little piece. And this is, is a true art form, actually. It's, I would say it's one of my dad's uh, greatest skills as a mixer designer, is he knows how to do that. V very few people actually do. There's another really bad function in, or bad performance attribute in diode mixers that never really gets talked about, and this is really key to understanding why normal, mixers, normal diode mixers don't commutate. And it's the following. In principle, if it's a true switching mixer, the harder I drive it, the more linear it should become. But that's not what happens. If you look at our data sheets and double balance mixers or anybody else's, you'll always see that we specify a range of LO drive that we optimize the mixer over. This is the, the guaranteed spec. Uh, typically, that range could be plus 10 to plus 13 dBm or you know, maybe a little bit broader, plus 10 to plus 15. The reason we do that is um, multifold, but one of the, probably the biggest reason is that there's no improvement in the mixer linearity the harder you hit it. And it's deceptive why this happens, but here's a few explanations of the physical reason. The first is that as you drive the mixer harder and harder, it gener generates more and more DC rectified current that circulates in the diodes. That DC rectified current forward biases the diodes, so they never go from a fully on to a fully off state. They're always sort of like on. The other problem is that as you pump the mixer harder, you can actually reverse break down the diode itself. Most diodes, uh, most shocky diodes, as a rule of thumb, have a breakdown anywhere from about four or, five at, four or five times the forward voltage to maybe 10 times the forward voltage. So if, if the diode is 0.5 volts forward, the reverse <laughs> breakdown might be three volts reverse. It's possible to create an LO that easily exceeds that and breaks the diode down. So the quad essentially degenerates into this nasty nonlinear element, and you no longer improve the linearity as you, as you hit it harder. So what mixer guys learned throughout you know, the 60s and 70s and 80s was, OK, well, if I can't drive the mixer harder, what can I do? Well, I just swap the diode out and put a, a larger diode in, a larger forward voltage diode. Larger forward, vo larger forward voltage means that the LO signal, sorry, the, R, the small RF signal cannot intermodulate the IV curve, therefore I just never generate as much intermod. And so that's the basic explanation. So what we find is that if we drive 
standard double balance mixers and standard triple balance mixers very hard, we don't improve linearity. I get this question a lot and it's a tricky one, but it's very easy to, sh easy to show. So if I start with a low power for, uh, single harmonic LO, which is a sine wave, and then I turn it into a very large square wave signal, I don't actually improve linearity. So this approximation that Walker had is bogus. And you can go home and, and do the test yourself. You may find some improvement, but it's not across the board, and it's not nearly as good as this equation would show.